Hello and welcome to Talks on Scary Talks, a documentary review podcast where the co-hosts and guests discuss and review and give recommendations on any and all types of documentaries. Episode, we will be reviewing the following scary talks. Sean, Selected Prime, Ghosts in Ghost Towns, Haunting the Wild West, HP, Selected Netflix, The Devil, and Father of Forth. And I, Selected Prime Rental, Beware the Slender Man. <laughs> We're talking about fire and s'mores and <laughs> got it. Uh, Good old camping experience. times. Yeah, well, mine was just in the backyard. <laughs> just in the backyard. Just, what, just doing <laughs> s'mores for the first time in one of the aluminum, like you know, ice buckets. So yeah, built a giant tower of fire. <laughs> Nobody called the cops on you. No, or the fire yeah, department. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 had a, I totally, you know, had the hose ready. I was safety first, you know. <laughs> Nobody got burned. Just a little pink. <laughs> and they were awesome s'mores. Like they cooked like that. Oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm pretty confident I've got Skype running now and recording. I hate Skype. It's just, I don't get why they have to fix something that's not broken. Like, why do you constantly have to do updates and make problems for you? <laughs> you know? And it's, know? It almost made me feel like I was in a, like one of those stupid dad moments where you keep on trying to fix something and <laughs> you realize you're an idiot. Like, I had one <laughs> of those moments this week. Kaden came in and she was trying to cook something in the microwave and it would throw the circuit. Like, the instant she would hit start, it would throw the circuit. Mm -hmm. I was like, you've got to be freaking kidding me. <laughs> I thought I was done with, like, fixing things for a while, you know? And Do you, do you still have, like, the screw-in circuits? Uh, oh, nice. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I actually do have a, an actual panel on my house and stuff. That's okay. With the breakers and stuff. So I start freaking out that... Okay, because I installed the microwave, it was, what, maybe a year ago? And it was brand new. And so I was, like, getting pissed off. I was like, I can't believe I'm going to have to replace this thing if it's going bad. Or maybe, hopefully, it's just a circuit. So I start running all these different tests. So first thing I did is I, like, turned all the other, or unplugged everything else that went to that circuit other than the microwave. Went to start it, throws the fuse. It's like, you got to be kidding me. So... Then I did another thing where I unplugged the microwave and then I put uh, one of those heavy duty like steamers that like really draw a lot of energy, like hand cleaning steamers, and put yeah. it on that same circuit to see if it would throw it, testing out the breaker. And it wouldn't throw it. And I was like, okay, freaking, okay, so that kind of eliminates out the circuit. It's looking more like it's the microwave that's the problem. So then I took the. So I took an extension cord and plugged the microwave into the extension cord and ran it to another plug that I knew was on a separate circuit and went to turn on the microwave to see if it was going to run. It freaking shuts down instantly. It's like, you have got to be freaking <laughs> kidding me. This brand new microwave that I spent like an entire day installing because I had to mount it underneath the cabinets and take out the stove and everything. And so... I'm, Did you ever I'm, take it to a bathtub of water and see if it worked? <laughs> right. I was about to. <laughs> <laughs> For the so, longest time, I was my I was like my mom's joke with my dad that she would throw the she would throw the uh, the toaster in the tub or something yeah. like that. I didn't understand until I finally like <laughs> learned. I'm like, oh my god, mom's gonna kill dad. <laughs> <laughs> this whole time. <laughs> Jeez. So, 
Then I decide to go ahead and open up the microwave to see what Kaden is trying to cook and realize she's not using a microwave safe bowl. So I easily switch her food into a microwave safe bowl and it worked just fine. So I spent about 45 minutes. Simple solution is usually it. Right, I know. So I spent like 45 minutes, almost an hour, trying to fix a problem where all I had to do was change the bowl out that she was trying to cook. Was it was this like a countertop microwave or a hood? It's like a hood hood mounted. It's kind of like a hood mounted one. It does vent out into the room. So I mean, it's a it's a high quality, high powered yeah. microwave. It, I mean, it's one of those microwaves where you can do the convection un oven in as well too. So you like unbolted it from the wall to do all no, this? No, I didn't do that. So it only has one plug. It has one plug oh, okay. that runs up un up through the cabinet. Oh, so it's okay. mounted underneath a cabinet. It's gotcha. just like suspended on the bottom gotcha. of the cabinet. And so there's one hole that I had to drill out for the plug to come through and then plugs in inside of the cabinet. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, 45 minutes wasted on me not switching out a freaking bowl because Kaden <laughs> decided to use. She's like, well, I've used it 100 times before. I was like, yeah, well, not today. <laughs> <laughs> and no more. So. Wow. So yeah, that was my stupid dad moment of the week. Uh, yeah, I love that you were just so committed to it, and the family's just like over whatever it was that you're trying to like watch or, or stream or you know whatever. Usually it's something to do with that that in my house where I'm like, no, we can watch this show. I just need to stream it to this and share it to that, and it'll be on the big screen TV. <laughs> and hour and a half later, everybody's like, whatever. Can we just watch a DVD? <laughs> <laughs> and by that point you're committed it's like no we are going to watch this and like it <laughs> yeah. did, did anybody else see the Joker movie yet Joker no no, no. Yes. we yes. did go to the movies our family did yeah well I would have taken a kid to Joker that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> we, we saw a much more family friendly movie than Joker what would that be What's out it was there, abominable right? Oh, okay. How was that? It was actually so that yeah, the four year old and the, the six year old both liked it and you know, had a good message. A little bit you know, as the world tends to go nowadays, a little bit overly, you know, we're screwing everything up, we need to save right. the animals, but um was it and it's like in Japan or China. I think it's I can't remember one of those. The bottom would probably most likely be Japan, right? Yeah, it was the, it well at Mount mostly. Everest, wherever that is. That's Chi well, it's Tibet, but yeah. So, uh, yeah, and it's it's the yet they call him the Yeti, yeah. they call him Abominable, and they call him Everest. The funniest thing though is it starts out, and obviously you're in you know Japan, China, big city, and obviously they're Asian characters, and they all speak English. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> like I just thought it was funny that you know, for once the the Chinese Japanese folks are going to see it in their language and it's in right. their city versus how they probably see our American cartoons yeah. with subtitles. The so. best is when they do that kind of thing. And then they have like a British accent in like <laughs> India, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it was good. It was a good storyline and you know, the kids liked it and it was just about the right length to keep them interested. So it was, uh, I'd recommend it for, for little kids, preschool or kindergarten on up. Cool supposed to do a joker review on another podcast earlier this evening but uh one of their co-hosts he's he's a new daddy they have like a, i think a month old infant and so mm -hmm. he had to cancel so i ended up not doing that but there. yeah you're in the heart of the war there <laughs> yes yeah. yes that first uh the first six months six to yeah about six months that's about where it starts to kind of taper down a little bit on average. Well, if it's your your first kid too, I mean that was right. That was where I came to understand why shaken baby syndrome happens. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, if you're not on your game and have the willpower to put that kid down, there are times where you're like, I'm done. <laughs> right. You know, well, there's just walk away. Right. There's just no soothing them whatsoever, and that's what you have yeah. to realize. It's just it could be a billion different things, and then with our kids, they with all of them being adopted and being fostered, uh, a lot of the times they were, they were literally uh, detoxing off of some 
drug, you know, yeah. most of them methamphetamines, you know, so, and yeah. it's crazy to see what their bodies go through because they go through, like, they, they don't really know, their bodies don't really sweat at that age, at, at newborn, yeah. and so basically they just kind of, like, burn it out. Their skin gets, like, really, really red and uh, really mm -hmm. hot to the touch and stuff, and uh, yeah, it's sad. They ended up having to cancel, but it's all right. It's all good. I guess I'll try to hopefully do that review with them tomorrow. The name of the podcast is What's the Focus? And they cover a lot of pop culture stuff. And they're a fairly new podcast, actually. They're about like 30 episodes or so. So they're mm -hmm. a little bit behind us. Speaking of podcasts, I, I, listen, I like the intro you did for your voice. Oh, <laughs> scary, <laughs> my little yeah. scary docs. Yeah. Yeah, I did it for this one, too. So, <laughs> yeah, that voice is a little rough on my on my voice box so i'm yeah. still a little bit of recovery from doing that before the sh <laughs> before us recording any uh liquid stress reduction going on there to help you uh yeah whiskey of course so <laughs> okay. yeah I, I, I told sean i got my uh apple hill delfino hard cider going nice yeah actually i, I made some um hard cider for my wife right before i came out here so <laughs> but it was store-bought you know the kind that you mix out of a box you know not all fancy like you from apple hill and yeah, I've never, never had that before. <laughs> I just go from the source. These are apples that were grown entirely by the Delfino family in Camino, California. Mm. Yes, yeah. Who is not a sponsor of the podcast? Just to be... <laughs> negative, negative. Feel free to send samples, though. We will. <laughs> we would you. love to make you a sponsor. <laughs> right. Yes. Brought to you by our one percenter, HB. <laughs> <laughs> Gladly sponsored by his beautiful wife, <laughs> the money maker. Right, that's right. We've already determined that, huh? That your wife is the, uh, <laughs> you're just the trophy to your wife. <laughs> yes, yes. Hey there, thanks for joining us. Uh, let us introduce ourselves. I'm Sturdy. I'm HB. And I'm Sean. All right, guys, you want to go ahead. We'll go ahead and go into our Apple Podcast ratings and reviews, emails, and a new part to this uh, section called corrections. Oh. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> All right. Time to give a little thanks and appreciation for the emails and Apple Podcast reviews. All right, as I stated, uh, the new addition to this is corrections. We don't have any kind of ratings or reviews or emails or anything, but we did get a correction through social media. Uh, last week, uh, when we were talking about time machines, uh, oh, boy. and you were talking about, <laughs> yeah, somebody corrected us about time machines. <laughs> oh, wow. Something that doesn't exist. <laughs> well, we're full into the geek squad world here. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, actually, it dealt with, uh, you were talking about that Stephen King book, and uh, we couldn't quite remember the the title of it, the one where he goes yeah. back and tries to stop the assassination of JFK. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, the name of that series, uh, it's a television series, is actually on Hulu, and I had said Amazon. Oh, and dare you. I know. And the title of that uh, is 11.22.63, which I would guess is the day that JFK was assassinated. I believe that's the day he's assassinated. Yeah. So that's the title of it, and it's on Hulu, not Amazon. So please forgive me for that massive mistake. But if you do catch us in any kind of errors and would like to correct us, feel free to send us an email. We have absolutely no problems with recorrecting or making those corrections on our shows because we, the last thing we want to do is give you false information. Right, you guys? Yeah, no, no fake absolutely. news. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's why we like documentaries, right? It's because it's telling the truth all the time, right, Sean? Yeah, they're never fake. Never. <laughs> they're never Concrete fake. floats. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, JFK was assassinated November 22nd, 1963. Thank you. According yes. to Wikipedia. At 12.30 yeah. p.m. Central Standard Time in Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, that'll do it for Apple Podcast ratings and reviews, emails, and corrections. Feel free to throw <laughs> us any emails, reviews, or corrections. We're totally fine with that. Thanks. All right. Let's go ahead and head on to our selections for next week. 
During the next section, the co-hosts keep it fresh and spoiler-free as they announce their selections for next week's podcast. All right, for our selections for next week, I'll go ahead and start. Mine is going to be another pay one on Prime. I hope you guys are cool with that. It should be like, I think, maybe four bucks to rent it. And, sorry, is that are you guys cool with that? <laughs> I'll live with it, yeah. That's right. fine. I promise it'll be my last one for this season <laughs> of Scary Docs. All right, uh, so mine is going to be Prime Wrinkles the Clown. Have you guys seen the preview for this? Yes. <laughs> so you already know a little bit of it. All this right. is creepy. Yes. So the synopsis now in theaters, well, actually now on Prime too, started with a YouTube video, a sleeping child oblivious to the clown slowly emerging from under her bed. Soon, more mysterious videos surfaced. Wrinkles the Clown explores the internet phenomenon and the hysteria it inspired. On Amazon, it's got three out of five stars, but there's only 14 reviews on it so far. I mean, this thing's brand new. It came out last week. Wow. And on IMBD, it's got a little bit more of a description. It says, in Florida, parents can hire Wrinkles the Clown to scare their misbehaving children. How nice, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <That's> so disturbing. <laughs> right, I know. What's wrong with this world? I don't know. It's got a 4.5 out of 10 on IMBD. It's not superb. Meta score of 53, so it's like, you know, it's getting an F. <laughs> if you don't want to put a score on it. It's early. But it also looks very creepy as hell when you watch the trailer. Uh, and it's directed by Michael Beach Nichols. That's it. You haven't seen the preview for this, HP? No, 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 no. no. Okay. Well, you should have fun with it. I know Jen just about <laughs> ripped off the second portion of my arm when she watched the trailer with me. Oh. She was so freaked out, especially that part where it talks about he's hiding underneath the, the little girl's bed and slowly creeps out from underneath the bed. It's all like hidden camera footage. So, so this has to be a morning watch for me then? No, no. It's <laughs> this is like terrible. About 1130 <laughs> at night will be perfect. <laughs> just let me know when you're watching it, okay? <laughs> so I can uh, uh, get out my costume. <laughs> right. <laughs> you wouldn't enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, clowns at sunrise. Right. I'd get shot. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> All right. Well, HB, what do you have? So I have. I went a little offbeat, but still uh, might be horrific to some. Yeah. It is. It's on Prime as well. I think it's free, but don't quote me on that. It is Rats. 2016 movie. Okay. And the synopsis is. This is a inspired... documentary, right? It's a documentary. I okay. <laughs> it is a documentary inspired by Robert Sullivan's New York Times best-selling book Rats. It goes deep beneath the surface to explore the lives of man's greatest parasite. Oscar-nominated director Morgan Spurlock unveils a new form of documentary horror storytelling journeying around the world to bring viewers face-to-face -face with rats while delving into our complicated relationship with these creepy creatures. It has a runtime of 84 minutes. It came out Ooh. September of 2016. Uh, it has a tomato meter of 63%. Uh, not too bad. And uh, so I, I like Morgan Spurlock. Yeah. And that's honestly why... I, I don't agree with his politics all the time, but... Oh, IMDb was 6.5, so it's not climbing the charts, but... Yeah, it's better um, than mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like Morgan Spurlock. I think he's got a, usually a funny take on things, and he's just willing to just literally kill himself at times to, you know, see the documentary through to the end. So I'm curious to see how this one goes. So, rats. Cool. So how did you come across this one? Just from Morgan Freeman? I was... Spur honestly, I, was, I had a mindset of... I wasn't searching for Spurlock. I honestly was thinking of something like offbeat but Halloween related. Right. So I wanted to find like something. I honestly searched for like scary candy or something. I was thinking something <laughs> with like how crazy the food that we eat at Halloween, like what it probably does to us and what it looks like or, you know, right. something. And then this came up somehow. Okay. <laughs> and it was probably tied into my, my Morgan Spurlock 
uh, the fact that I've watched all of his movies except right. for his newest one. And this one, I think it tied into my likes that I like Morgan Spurlock. So that grabbed me and made me give it a shot. Awesome. Cool. That one looks pretty cool. All right. Hey, Sean, what do you got? I have Jack Pierce, the maker of monsters, also on Amazon Prime. Uh, it has five stars on Amazon Prime, but it's only got one rating, so I can't really count it. <laughs> um, it's got a 7.2 out of 10 on IMDb. It's by directed and written by Streffen Taylor. It came out in 2015 and has a runtime of 82 minutes. So the synopsis is, uh, which was written by the director, in today's cinematic <laughs> world of digital effects, telling what is real from what was created in a computer is impossible. But there was a time when Hollywood relied on nothing more than an artist's ability to create a boogeyman with grease paint, cotton, glue, hair, and a few simple materials to draw people into the theater to be chilled and thrilled. When we think back to those talents of the silver screen, most people think of the man of a thousand faces, Lon Chaney. But Universal Studios had its very own phantom creating the world's most memorable creatures lurking in its substages. His amazing ability to create makeups that can still stand toe-to-toe with today's multi-million dollar effects is worth a closer look. Jack Pierce was the man who brought us Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, the mummy, the wolfman, Bride of Frankenstein, and countless other monsters that have stood the test of time. Drawn from recorded interviews, historical footage, hundreds of photos, including Jack Pierce's personal scrapbook, and new clippings, we meet the maker of monsters, Jack P. Pierce. Join his ver- journey from Greece to the budding film industry in Los Angeles in the early 1900s to his rising star as a freelance film hand, eventually becoming the head of Universal's makeup department and creating the monsters that we all grew up with and still love. 82-minute documentary covers his entire career and life, including the surprising hand Pierce had in American Olympics history, plus all the classic monsters your heart can stand. That is so cool, dude. I'm excited yeah. about this one. Because <laughs> I love I, doing makeup and the FX stuff for like costumes and stuff. Like I hate those mm-hmm. like uh, just that lame latex mask where you just like literally like zip the thing on. And it like stinks <laughs> and you can't breathe. You can't drink through it, which is the worst part about it. You know, I like the mm-hmm. the foam latex ones, where the ones you got to actually like glue the thing onto your face with latex and paint it and do all that other stuff and I've always loved that type of costume work and just taking it literally like to the next level kind of like Hollywood style so that that sounds like it would be a really fun little watch there yeah I think you know it's got movie history and and yeah. uh, and you know the classic monsters that we all think about when we think about horror movies so yeah I hope it's I hope yeah. it's as good as it seems yeah, so yours is not a pay, but sh- uh, HB yours is a pay. Oh, okay. It's a rental. Yeah, Rats is a rental. So I'm sorry it's going to cost you $8 <laughs> for the next episode, people. Oh, if boy. you want to stay with us. I know. We're going to have to start selling some merch or something. I know. Yeah, get a GoFundMe <laughs> page going. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, I've, I feel sorry for our listeners, you know. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> they're probably all gonna find some way to find some way to you know watch it for free anyways oh yeah every everybody uses their friends log in right yeah. I'm the only one with the the morals and ethics not to do that <laughs> yes yep. you're the only one you one person <laughs> <laughs> well there's one document okay well no wait that's gonna be our short are you guys ready to go into our short doc yes yeah, yeah. let's go ahead and go into our short doc because the next doc I want to bring up or that I want to select is going to be really hard for people to get so I'm like I really want to watch this one but I don't think I'm going to be able to select it because it's so hard to get and this document this short will actually explain that so let's go ahead and go into our short doc of the week keeping it short and snappy a quick look conversation on a few short subject docs. All right, so our short for the week is called The Documentary So Disturbing They Tried to Destroy It, and it's a documentary that was filmed in the late 60s, I think 67, 68, about Titicut Follies. 
And this is a documentary that has been politicized extensively and has literally been banned and in multiple states and everything has been tried to get this documentary completely destroyed and not available whatsoever. Uh, they say in here in this documentary that the, or I'm sorry, in the short documentary on YouTube is that it is available on YouTube, uh, but I have not yet been able to find it. But I know it, it is available on Canopy, which is a free service through through um, through libraries. But your library, your local library, has to carry Canopy, which ours does not. So that mm. kind of creates a problem for us here locally. Uh, the only place that supports canopy and that's canopy with a k is las vegas which we're not allowed to get through uh so yeah the washoe county school or washoe county library does not support canopy but i know bigger cities and such i'm sure los angeles chicago new york all those places support canopy and you could watch uh, this full documentary called titicate follies so it's t-i-t-i C U T Follies F O L L I E S, and so I'll definitely check into it and see if there's more available. If it if the full length uh, documentary is available on YouTube, uh, but to go a little bit more extensive into this, it documents it's a black and white it's a black and white documentary that literally documents the patients inside of an asylum. It would be like a a, a current day or like what a life like uh, Arkham Asylum would basically be. Uh, yeah. That's what the feeling that you get is, is that they're going into this. It looks pretty decrepit, old, uh, kind of ran down. I don't know if it's just because it's black and white footage, but it doesn't look like it's like the best of conditions for these mental patients that are literally like locked away in this asylum. Yeah. I mean, what was your guys' take on this thing? I mean, it was, it was disturbing. I mean, they talk about it as being a, a horror, but I, I think honestly, the horror is just knowing that it's reality, right? To these, to these people mm. that are being treated for criminal insanity, for whatever they may have done. But yeah, it's just disturbing. What it's like human zombies in that one scene where they're just walking around, whether it's drug induced or mentally, you know, disability induced. Mm -hmm. They're just stumbling around half naked or, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I We're talking about the 60s here, late 60s. You'll have to talk to your wife, HB, and find out a little bit more for us. But pharmaceutically wise, I don't think there was much, much medications out there for mental health. There might have been, um, I don't know, maybe lithium. Yeah. Uh, basically morphine, I think, is morphine? pretty much all they did. Yeah. And morphine is just basically turning you into just a slobbering fool it's not doing anything for your mental state yeah. it's literally just like turning all the light switches off yeah was it just like the electrotherapy or whatever they called it lobotomizing and right yeah 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 and from what i understand uh, i don't know if there's a difference between the, but i mean they would just you know drill a hole and kind of stir a stick around in you <laughs> and, and hope it disconnected some of the stuff that was making you act the way you were and it was better if you ended up catatonic than stayed the same yeah well, a lobotomy is basically there's a bridge between your left and right brain, and they cut that bridge between the left and right brain. Oh, okay. Is from is what I remember. I could be completely wrong. Please correct me if I am. <laughs> please correct. <me. laughs> I, I, I'm serious. Please do. Uh, we yeah. we do want to know if we are wrong on things. But uh, I mean, that's my last understanding of what a lobotomy was, or having your. Yeah. Basically, they go in and split the left and right brain, so there no mm. there's no connection between the two of them. And yeah, electroshock therapy was probably a biggie back then. Uh, yeah, I picked one flew over the cuckoo's nest with Jack Nicholson's one that comes to my mind. Yeah. So actually, this reminds me a lot of Joker movie. Uh, I think watching this after watching the Joker movie would actually be a very very disturbing combination. <laughs> but actually a very good combination. <laughs> Would he have been a better stage performer, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. So, wow. 
Yeah, what else did what else stood out on this one for you guys? So there's that that guy that that is totally coherent and he's just he's just flat out saying, "Look, I don't know what you guys are doing, but I keep getting worse and it's got to be the treatment." Mm. Yes. So, you know, and he's totally coherent. Yes. Mm. I was reading through some of the comments and someone had watched the full doc and they said, "Yeah, they laugh at him after that." Like it's just Oh uh, man. Yeah. It, it's just it's so disturbing the way these in, or not inmates these patients are treated. Right. Like you can see in the hallway the naked guy. You know, at points they seem like they're honestly trying to ask him to say what he's trying to say. Jim. But then yeah. they it just triggers him, and then they just feed into it. You know, we can't understand you, we can't hear you, and it just ratchets him up. And mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, they're they're just toying with him because they can. You know, and there's enough yeah. of them there to. Hold him down if he flips out. Hopefully, hopefully not, because he needs some revenge sometimes. But yeah, yeah. So that scene you were talking about, Sean, that's the one that made me think about uh, Joker movie uh, because there's a scene where uh, Arthur's talking to his psychologist, which is actually on the uh, on the on the uh, trailer of him talking. You know, I'm not getting any better. Kind of, you know, all I. Th- all my thoughts are negative thoughts or bad thoughts or evil thoughts and it's not working. And you see that kind of development throughout the, the Joker movie as well too. So that's what made me start to think about how good of a pairing, I guess you could say (laughs) this documentary would be with Joker movie. Yeah, it'll be interesting if we can find that somewhere. somewhere. Yeah, I'll definitely have to look into YouTube because he does mention the director. He mentions specifically that this is available on YouTube. So, uh, when was this? It looks like it was put on May of 2018. So, there might be a good chance that it hasn't been taken off yet. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just did a search, didn't find anything. But I mean, no. there's. There's about 150 reviews of this documentary. Yeah, you know, of people mm. people talking about it and referencing it, but I can't find it the, the documentary itself. Yeah, I'll have to sit here and go through all these hundreds of <laughs> comments. I just I just found it on uh, eBay. Oh, huh? eBay. The uh, yeah, the, you'd have to buy the, it. Right, Kitty Cut yeah. Follies uh, DVD from 1967. <laughs> Eleven dollars and eighty cents. So we'll buy it, copy it, put it on YouTube. <laughs> it's got to break some laws, huh? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. It's got subtitles. It's it says it. It definitely looks like somebody did exactly that and then just resold it to eBay. All right. Well, I'll put it on our social media uh, outlets if we do end up finding a place for this to be viewed. So yeah, just look us up. Talks on Docs, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Talks on Docs, you'll find us. So, you guys, re- anything else on this one? No. No. All right, we'll go ahead and go into our breakdown. Boy, oh, Prepare to be spoiled. In the breakdown section, our co-hosts go deeper into the conversation and truly express their thoughts on the documentaries. All right, we're going to go ahead and go into our breakdown section now. Uh, let's go ahead and start with yours, Sean. All right. So my documentary last week was Ghosts in Ghost Towns, Haunting the Wild West. On Prime. On Prime. <laughs> it was from 2018 and had a runtime of one hour and 49 minutes. So this uh, was rather disappointing for me, this documentary. Well, was... I was hoping for a lot more ghost stuff. Right. It was um, too long. It, it was it was 
there was too much. They went to too many ghost towns. They should have focused on four or five ghost towns right. and the ghost stories in each one of those. And this was just, it was, here's a cool ghost town. Here's some ghosts. Uh, here's here's like the name of some ghosts and maybe, you know, a, a two minute synopsis of what they might be the haunting with mm-hmm. that one ghost. And yeah. then they moved on to the next one and then they moved on to the next one. I'd say redeeming qualities of this was um, there's a lot of cool ghost towns that they look at. Right. Um, there's a lot more cool out history. there than I thought. <laughs> <That's> yeah. <funny. laughs> the, the history part of it was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but what constitutes a ghost town? Like four shacks? Right. Like some of them like this is not a town. This was like you know, a camping a mining settlement. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like they had a minor strike and uh, it lasted, you know, what, a, a couple of weeks and then they're yeah. out. Of that doesn't really count, I wouldn't think. Right. Uh, this did have a greatest moment. Oh, uh, dude. Uh-huh. Did. I, I knew yeah. there had to have been one in there because there were so many that were so close. Like mm-hmm. every time they went to a new ghost town, there was like, the, yeah. the, you know, the most, the best. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, there's mm-hmm. got to be a greatest. Yeah. And I just missed it. So what was it? So uh, the three Montana boom towns, Bannock, Virginia City, and Nevada City, are united in one of the Wild West's greatest outlaw stories and legends. Oh, nice, dude. Boom. And that's when they were talking about the uh, – the sheriff that got killed by the vigilantes uh-huh. um, and they, they think he was probably innocent. <laughs> and then it was the vigilantes that were really doing the crimes. Yeah. Yeah. That was a weird story, man. That was pretty in depth story. Uh, that was probably the most in depth story out of all of them. Yeah. You know, there was that one and there was like the, the haunting investigator guys at the very yeah. end. Um, yeah. That's what I expected out of this documentary. Was, right. You know, yeah. like they take the story of that sheriff and do an investigation and, and you know, mm-hmm. give us some background. And, but that was not what this documentary was, unfortunately. Right. So, well, with each. I, yeah. Yeah. With each story, they talked about uh, that there's been recordings or photos or, mm-hmm. you know, first person witnesses. And it's just like so you would think that the next step would be showing us. Or mm-hmm. interviewing those people, or letting us hear those uh, recordings, or, or whatever, whatever they had, yeah. you know. But they mm-hmm. never do, up until yeah. the very end. It's just like, yeah. and that's okay. the weakest ghost story yeah. of, the, of the bunch is the one that they actually do a, a haunting investigation, <laughs> right? <on>. Yeah. <laughs> By the end of that one, they're like, oh, it's a nice place. They're nice, nice ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like it's Casper and family. Right. Yeah, yeah so, I, I seriously, I had an issue with that. Like they, they, there was nothing in Nevada. Like I'm sorry. Like I feel like they. <laughs> that was like, my I issue. Like they, yeah, I feel like they totally skipped any towns except for a couple that had active people in it. Like they didn't want to ruin the fact that like a ghost town drives away all the people, which it doesn't always. Like I'm sorry, Virginia City has ghosts coming out the wazoo. Carson City yes. has ghosts coming out the wazoo. Like <laughs> there's at least half a dozen ghost cities in Nevada. Yes. And I could probably name off the top of my head. But I yeah. feel like they didn't want to talk about them cuz they were like somewhat current and still occupied yeah. to an yeah. extent. Yeah. It's so weird because yeah, I mean they literally go around the entire state of Nevada, I think. Mm-hmm. Right? They go to California. Oh, yeah. Arizona, yeah, Montana, Montana yeah. Colorado, Mexico. Utah, or Utah, yeah. U- Utah, yeah, absolutely, completely around the state of Nevada, and yeah. never touch anything whatsoever. Yeah. I was like, that was a huge disappointment for me because it, that's what you were thinking. Because they even said Virginia City, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. they're finally going to talk about Virginia City, and then like, I was like. That's not our Virginia City. So I like looked up on yeah. the map and I was like, no, Nevada City and Virginia City are in, what was it, Montana? Montana, Montana. yeah. Yeah, Montana. I was like, okay. Uh, yeah. I would have to, I do have to say that I do love the cinematography and a lot of those shots though because it's so, it's so to home for us, you know. Those are the scenes yeah. that we see all the time and it kind of like brings you back to home. And it's like one of the reasons I love Western so much is because all yeah. those shots and stuff are like in our back door, you know, right out, right outside. And they are very scenic and gorgeous scenes to look at. And especially the ones up in Montana with those, mm. the, the open plains and stuff. And 
So those those were gorgeous. That's one that's one thing I really loved about this documentary was that yeah. that they took the time to took the to take those shots and include them into the into the documentary. It did it did get very repetitive. Like they had a mm-hmm. formula and they had a pattern of telling each story, like the intro, the map, like this it was very repetitive and like, you know, the way they did it, like at first, yes, all those picturesque scenes, but then it was like you could predict like insert story here. Uh, storyteller guy says this is one of the <laughs> greatest of such and such. All right, all right, a little narration, and then intro into next story. Here comes the map. Like they, I, 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 they needed to diverge a little bit from their formula and like add a little something different. It was a little too like repetitive. Yeah. yeah. But I liked all the stories and the history. I did like the history of the story. Each each town has a little history snippet of like how they became a boom town, how they became a ghost town, and who the big ghost in the town was. Mm. I liked that. Yeah. Uh, have any of you guys ever walked through a ghost town other than our local Virginia City ones or Carson City? Like one of There's these, no. kind of like Ruby. Ruby, I guess, would be the closest one to us. Out of all these, or no, I'm sorry, it would be what's the one in California that they talk about? The very first one. Oh, Bodie. Bodie. Yeah, I've never been no. to Bodie for sure. I've never been to any of the ones that were in the dock. Uh, uh, well, I've been to Cripple Creek, uh, which isn't really a ghost town. As a little, little, little kid, we went to Bodie, but I don't remember it. I know that there's photographs out there of me being at this ghost town, but that's it. <laughs> And that that was the weird one where you like if you took something from from Bodie you'd be cursed. Yeah, bad and, luck. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You had like this streak of bad luck, and people were like like a nail, a rusty old nail. They'd send yeah. it back yeah. <laughs> to the local. Yeah. So the you know that's that's what the doc started with was Bodie. Right. And, and yeah. you know I was like, okay, this has good potential, right? It yeah. Was, yes. The, you know they tell story of Bodie and and the guy mm-hmm. that. It, the, who it's founded on and and then they got this curse and i'm like oh this is kind of cool i'm kind of yeah. into it and mm-hmm. then and then just it went downhill <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then it was copy paste because everything's worse after that <laughs> yeah so so the funny thing is uh you know we went camping this week because it was fall break and so i uh i had to download all these to my ipad and watch them at the campground and there's a there's an abandoned sheep camp that's about a mile and a half from the campground oh. uh, that that has all it looks just like one of these ghost towns like it's got a couple of old buildings that are still standing and and it's this big open meadow and that's about all you can see and there's like a furnace and but so <laughs> sheep bang in the distance yeah I was like I was like wow this is kind of kind of fitting that I'm up here. <laughs> I was kind of glad that it wasn't a scary <laughs> documentary since I was, you know, like a mile and a half from one of these places. Yeah. I was even uh, thinking about that because I knew you were a camp and I was like, I wonder if, uh, if any of these documentaries are going to kind of mess with Sean being up in the, <laughs> <laughs> up in the Sierra Nevadans out camping and stuff. So, <laughs> Yeah. The, did, uh, going back to like any ghost experience, ghost towns, the one I'm thinking of is Goldfield in Nevada. Mm. That is like, so I drove through Goldfield a ton growing in high school, college, because I went to UNLV. Yep. So I would drive through Goldfield, I don't know, three, four times a year, you know, twice each time. Yep. And that that town, I wished I could have stopped because I'm sure they had ghost tours. Because yeah. they literally, I, I got to give the, the residents credit, they would put those wooden cutouts of like old tiny yes. people from like Victorian in weird places. Yeah. And literally I, you're cruising through there cause it says it's 25 and you know, some like County Sheriff's going to nail you <laughs> if you're doing 30 yep. or 27 and you catch out of the corner of your eye, like some weirdo. And it's like, <laughs> a, a, it's a, it's a, it's an old washed out, you know, cut out yep. of a dude in a cowboy hat or a gal in a Victorian dress. Right. And they got those old like courthouse buildings and, Yep. Nobody's ever there, but the cars are, are in different places, and that was you know, one ghost town experience. I didn't see anything besides that, but I always just had the heebie-jeebies, like some ghost is going to just jump on my – especially the couple times I couldn't plan it to not drive through at night because I would plan my drives 
I didn't want to drive around Walker Lake at night just because <laughs> I literally thought it was a black hole of death that like I could feel <laughs> like a psychotic or a uh, mental sucking feeling. Like I just felt like Walker Lake is creepy. <laughs> like it just sucks your spirit in and nobody's going to know you're in there. It's right. just this weird lake in the middle of the desert. Yep. And then Goldfield. Like I did not want to go through those two places at night if I could help it. <laughs> um, and only a couple times did I fail in avoiding it. <laughs> and it white knuckles the whole way. The one little other ghost experience I guess I have in my family is my mom had a had an old Victorian house in Kirsten City, on the west side of town, the old side of town. Mm. And she had it passed down, and she had it from years and years before she met my dad in her first marriage. And it was a three-story Victorian. had a horse post in the front where you could tie your horse up to. I mean, it was built in the 1800s. Nice. And it had a haunted piano. Sounds weird. But it was, it was a good, good, good piano, good haunted piano. Yes. <laughs> because she would host these dinner parties, and... People would sit down at the piano in some course of the evening, you know, and randomly, like, you know, start plinking away, playing chopsticks or whatever. And occasionally somebody would all of a sudden start belting out some crazy, you know, Beethoven or some cool song. Mm. And you would ask the person, oh, cool, where'd you learn to play that? And they're like, I don't know how to play. (laughs) I've never, I've never played before besides like ding, 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 boom, boom, you know, (laughs) and literally it was like this feeling that not everybody would get, but occasionally, and you would just whip out a song and it was cool, like old timey song. And then you'd get up and be like, I don't know how I did that. So wait, was (laughs) this the one that was at the bottom towards like Mount Rose? Mount Rose Highway? No, it was off like, but Highway 50. It was over off like Division in Carson City. Um, and the, the, the streets over in that subdivision, it was actually bought by somebody from my, my mother when she was, when I was in high school Okay. and it's now owned by a different family. It had a little elevator, it was a three story and it had an elevator like that about the size of an old style phone booth. Yeah. You know, Google that, you millennials, <laughs> what a phone booth was. So was it very boxy, the, the building? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Dude, I know what you're talking about, dude. I remember hearing about that place being haunted as a kid because I lived in yeah. Carson as a kid too, back in from like mm-hmm. 77 to 80. Mm-hmm. And even, I mean, we'd go down to Carson all the time and I remember hearing about that yeah. hotel and that Victorian hotel and it being haunted and stuff. That's crazy, dude. I mean, yeah. all these years yeah. later and I'm hearing that your freaking family was the cause of it. <laughs> My mom loved it. Like she really didn't want to move out, but she knew it wasn't a place to raise a kid when they, you know, when I was coming into the picture. Because it just wasn't safe. She's like, sometimes you open the elevator door and it's not there. Right. right? And you fall two, three stories. And it'd be, that'd be bad. <laughs> so yeah. that's my ghost experience. I don't have any ghost experiences. My only ghost town experience was when I was a teenager there used to be, and I don't know, I've, I've heard that it was, somebody fixed it, but there was a glowing tombstone in Virginia City. Yeah. And, and you had to be up uh, across Main Street, basically, from the cemetery and look down on the cemetery at night, and you could see it glowing. Mm-hmm. And so we went up there, a big group of us with walkie-talkies and everything, because you couldn't <laughs> see it when you were right next to it. You had to be, across, like I said, across the Main Street looking down on the cemetery. And so, you know, we went with flashlights and walkie talkies and, and we got guided in to where the, where the glowing tombstone was. My guess, thinking back on it now at a teenager, when I was a teenager, I totally believed it, but I think they were messing with us across the street, but you could totally see it. <laughs> and, and they said, you know, when we got, you, we got close to it and we actually touched it, they said it got brighter and, and, and that kind of thing. But I, I think they were just messing with us. I mean, you could actually, you could see the glowing tombstone and I'm sure we got over to it, but I, I don't think it got brighter or anything. I, I think it was just a reflection the way the lights hit it and the way that tombstone hit sit, sits. But, uh, I've heard since then they have, the family has done something to it to make it so it doesn't glow anymore. <laughs> I got tired of people going up there and messing with it. Right. <laughs> Probably taking pieces off of it. Yeah. Right. Did I talk about the hotel or the mansion on California Street last time? Or with Mm -hmm. you guys? It was one of those high school things. There's, 
the mansion, one of those, you know how, okay, on California Street, it, it kind of dives down like it's going towards Reno High School. None of our mm-hmm. listeners are going to know what the hell I'm talking about. But anyways, <laughs> so in high school, one of the things was there's this, one of those big, huge houses on that street. And when you looked at the front window, they, they had this huge front to it. And above the front door on the like second or third level, they had this huge like glass stain circular window. And if you looked at it, you could see that there was a pentagram, an inverted uh, pentagram inside that circle, that mm-hmm. stained glass. And so the wise tale was that if you went into the backyard, there was one of the one of seven black towers gateways to hell and basically so you had to sneak in to the backyard of this mansion and then the backyard literally it was backyard and then went like cliff because it was that cliff that that goes down to the mm-hmm. front the front side of Virginia City or I'm sorry in front of Keystone and Reno High School so the only way you could get to that backyard was going through the front uh of the house. And so that was like Mm -hmm. the scary part about it. It was like walking through this, you know, through the side yard of this demonic house and finding this gate to, to hell as one of these black towers. And (laughs) I was never one to do it, but I had friends. So, you know, they said that, yeah, you would get back there and you'd see like, it looked like a, a shadow that just like streamed straight up into the sky is what they described it as. But who knows? Aww. Is the mansion still there? Have you? Uh, is yeah, the mansion but still there. I th- yeah, the the building's still there, but I think they've removed the glass, uh, the glass window, the glass stained window that's that used to be above the front. I mean, all those houses have changed quite a bit up there. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, for sure, multi million dollar homes up there now. All right. Anything else on uh, ghosts and ghost towns? Uh, I don't think so. I. I... I don't know that I regret watching it because the it was cool looking at the, the the old ghost towns and they do give a, a a a synopsis of almost every ghost town in the West, except for Nevada. <laughs> but uh, it, it it's yeah. a pretty weak recommend. It's not a very well put together documentary. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're totally right. It's copy and paste multiple times over, and yeah, it is such a letdown that they don't include anything about Nevada or Virginia City, especially since we live so close to it. So I live in kind of a weird area because the people across the street have a turkey. And like I was walking between my trailer and the house and all I could hear is this gobble 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 It's like this is not natural for us to be hearing turkey sounds. <laughs> or waking up in the middle of the night to mm. wild horses either fighting or having sex in my yard because they stomp <laughs> around and then they start making noises and yeah it's just like this is not <laughs> this is not what I should be this is this isn't what I should be waking up to in the 21st century is wild horses in my yard <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that reminds you of Apple Hill though like seriously it is a yes. weird mix of like polished orchards and and vineyards and then like straight up redneck like just farm <laughs> shacks yep probably the whole children under the stairs like three <laughs> generations and that that tree ain't got many branches on it you know like it is there's got to be some weird stuff like there's roads that are so narrow in apple hill like it is yeah it would be creepy yes. as all get out kind of like you're saying yeah just like walk your garbage can down to the end of your little dirt driveway and you know some like creepy old apple cart ghost probably comes rolling by you or something ichabod crane yeah or, that's I'm, sorry. I'm sure there's some ghost stories in for sure headless horseman yeah placerville with hangtown right there like how many dead hangtown ghosts are there right yeah did i tell you guys that i killed a rattlesnake in my yard the other day your kids told me Oh, my kids told you, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Did you eat? Did you cook it up and eat it? No, it was a little tiny baby. I mean, it was like literally no more than two weeks old. So we have a trampoline on the back part of the of the property, and Quinn, out of all of them, is running from the trampoline up towards our house. And there's like this kind of like uh, very sloped steps that come up off of the patio. 
and uh, she saw this little snake um, coiled up and hissing, and so she runs in and tells me, and Kaylin, in the midst of that, like literally like steps over the thing and doesn't even see it, and so I get out there, and it's it's so young, it doesn't even have like its first rattle on it, and I was trying to debate, okay, well, is this a rattler or a bull snake, because they're very, very similar, and they actually, perf- mm-hmm. they act like each other. Bull snake acts a lot like a, a rattler, a diamondback rattler. And then I got a really good look at the head of it. And this thing was literally really dimed off uh, with the poison sacks and stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's definitely a rattler all day long. And uh, so I got out my BB gun because I can't have a baby rattler running around in my backyard. Uh, and so my BB gun, it's got a scope on it, but it's scoped for 100 yards. And I'm like literally like five feet away from this thing. And so it's just like complete blurness when I look through my scope. And all I can see is this like darker brown outline of what the snake is. And I was like, okay, I can kind of make out that that's the head. And so I took one shot and like literally just about sliced the head off right at the neck or right where the head joins the body. And, uh, you know, snakes like you, you have to cut the head off to kill the freaking thing. Yeah, and so, like it literally like just about sliced the 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 body off its head, and so it's still because the body went completely limp, the rest of the body went completely limp. But when I went to go poke at it, the head was just completely active, like nothing had happened. You know, it's still open its mm. mouth and and spinning out its tongue and ready to to strike and stuff. So I had to get rid of it after that but yeah it was just like oh fantastic where's the rest of your family in my yard so yeah one time i came across a snake like that up in carson we used a shovel yeah just grabbed the the shovel and basically severed it in half yeah yeah it's just so tough with those bull snakes around here because they literally mimic a bull a rattler a diamondback rattler to the like the last thing which is there well two things that you can tell is well first it doesn't have a rattle but it will shake its tail Mm -hmm. and they have a little bit of a diamond shaped head uh but not nearly as pronounced as a rattler and this one definitely had very pronounced um Mm -hmm. uh venom sacks on it in its head so yeah that was my experience of living in the wild wild west where ghosts (laughs) and snakes and wild horses have sex in your yard (laughs) (laughs) Uh, that went off the tracks (laughs) 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 all right hp let's go to yours all right oh mine was the devil and father amorth uh synopsis of this was a 2017 documentary film directed by william fredkin of exorcist fame showing the ninth exorcism of an Italian woman named Christina in the Italian village of Vanafro by Father Amor- Gabriel Amorth. Yes. So, uh, was this on Prime? I totally spaced it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was on Prime. Um, I really liked this one. Yeah. I thought it was pretty educational. It was interesting. So, the, the, the director there, Mr. Fredkin, um, he did The Exorcist, but had never actually seen an exorcism uh, performed mm. until years and years later when he does this documentary. Um, and I honestly was like really wondering the build up to this exorcism. And, you know, they talked to this gal, Christina. She seems pretty nice, like, you know, mm. not middle aged, but, you know, 30s or 40s Italian gal. Seems really nice. Yeah, I've had eight exorcisms and. <laughs> Right. You know, I'm almost She's cured or whatever. And yeah, I have a boyfriend. Like, seem nice. Let's go have some gelato and, like, talk about your problems. Oh. And then they go into the, the room with Dr. Father Amorth, like, you know, cutting through a lot of stuff they talk about besides this. Yeah. And, like, the exorcism, I seriously, you know, I didn't disbelieve that exorcism existed. You know, Christian, my faith, I believe in the concept of the devil or his demons. Um, coming into people's bodies like that. I get that. I believe in that um, as a possibility. But um, I'd never seen anything real. And at first I'm like, okay, he's like saying some words. And it's all in Italian, so you really don't know what he's saying except for a few 
uh, translations and they definitely don't translate everything. I think probably like kind of, you know, keep his, you know, company secrets or so to speak from the yeah. Catholic church. I'm sure. Well, he, he was reading off of a prayer card. Yeah. He definitely had a script or a card. Yeah. Or, yeah. But when she, when he pisses that demon or that devil off, who says yeah. his name, who says he's Satan, like I, I don't. I think all the recording. That was what got me. Is her voice. I think yeah. all of the recording, like Father Amorth's voice, was normal. You could hear some chatter from the crowd, from the the guest people that were helping, and her family. Like it sounded normal. And then her right. voice, that demon voice coming out of her, saying right. it was Satan, mm -hmm. sounded like something electronically altered and yeah. like legitimately from like The Exorcist. And I was yeah. like. He couldn't have switched this. He literally has like just an old XLS or whatever they're called digital camera that he's filming yep. with. There's no equipment besides him and this one camera. Right. And her voice would literally change into this like demonic like voice of very masculine, very aggressive, mm -hmm. very assertive, and just the, the tone or pitch of it. I was like, yeah, that's that's a blanking demon right there. You maybe that's the big daddy himself, Satan. I don't know, but. <laughs> I'm buying this. Like I'm buying yeah. it. You know that that this is an exorcism of some. There is a demon in this woman. Yeah. Um, I don't totally get how why it takes eight or nine times and she still has the demon in her still after the end of this. Mm. You know, like you just got to stomp the hell out of it one good time. Like obviously Father Morth met his match because he he never succeeds with her. Right. But uh, well, it was yeah. It was a very interesting. I was thoroughly. I, I believe that this was a true exorcism. Well, they thought that she was good there for a second, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they go... They start blessing her family. Right. They go to bless her father, and the demons come back. And they, they also call themselves the Legion, which is actually mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. crazier to think about, because Legion is mul multiple demons at one. So I'm, mm -hmm. he she does say that I am Satan, and then she claims to be I am Legion, which I was like, oh, geez, that's that's another level there, too. Yeah, it's like uh, all of them. Right, yeah. And, yeah, so then her dad gets up there for the blessings, but then when mom starts to get blessed, she just freaking, that's a whole mm -hmm. other level she goes up in in the possession and fighting mm -hmm. against the, the, the people that are trying to restrain her and keep her down and stuff. And... It, what you're talking about with the voice, I kept on trying because it, it does sound like that there's a depth and a a reverb effect that's kind of like placed on it. Mm -hmm. So I kept on like watching and trying to see where there was a scene where there was her voice and then somebody else's voice in the same same second, right? Mm -hmm. Because if he's just recording on that DSR camera, I could see how they could chop that audio when it's just her and add those effects of the reverb and kind of like that echo effect and then also drop mm -hmm. the octave to it I was like so I was looking for those points but there are points where you can hear her voice and also the Amorth. Amorth's voice or people in the background's voice on that same track Mm -hmm. And if he was only allowed to take in that DSR camera and the mic that's on that thing, there's no way that they would be able to separate all those sounds out individually into tracks to where she, they could add that reverb and echo and depth effect. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I mean, maybe it's possible, but from what I've seen and have mm -hmm. worked with I've never been able to do something like that you know I think you could fake it he had a he had an external mic on that camera he had yeah he had a road mic on there I think you could fake it I don't know that they did I I I don't think it was faked mm -hmm. but I I think you could so would that just, camera would be able to, to record edit. separate tracks yeah it can that that those road mics will allow you to cuz he had an okay. external mic Oh, okay. I thought they were just Is that like the off fuzzy the ones just sticking out. Yeah, it was, yeah, that fuzzy one he had on top um, is no, actually a, that. It's a multi-channel. I must have missed that. I thought it was just mm. going off of the the front, you know, little digital mic it had. But that would be just I don't know. Like this was polished. Like you tell, he's a well a director that knew how to make a film and make a storyline, everything. But 
that would be so out of sorts with this. Like, there were so many things that I'm like, man, I wish he'd, like, polished this up a little bit or... Yeah, I I don't think he faked it, um, especially, you know, later on when he takes it to all the different um, mm-hmm. psychologists and psychiatrists and yes. and neuroscientists. And it's it's got that same sound because mm-hmm. every once in a while you can see him playing it with and it's it's that same voice. Mm-hmm. Um, I did really like that the doctors were talking about, like, especially the, with the, the group of doctors at Georgetown, they talked about it, whether this is a, a demon possession or a some type of neurological disease that's causing her to do this the the treatment is the same and exorcism is the treatment for it mm-hmm. because because that's what it takes to to get her brain to make the switch whether it's right. a demon or it is a, a neurological disease which I thought was was really kind of a I had never thought about it that way right yeah. that's that's kind of a cool take on it yeah yeah, yeah, I did like that. When they talked to that bishop or the archbishop from uh, was it L.A. or yeah, from L.A. Yeah, he was. You could tell once they got him like you know comfortable and he was open to opening a little bit. How he was like basically, no, like I wouldn't mess with this yeah. sort of demon, <laughs> this sort of deal. Like I'm not doing. I don't have the ability. I'm not. And he even said something to the effect of like his faith or his purity wasn't strong enough to where he could stand up to these demons like father remorse was like he was basically i was interpreting that to say you know father remorse is a very pure faithful honest god-driven person Mm -hmm. and i'm not like i'm an archbishop but i probably watch lots of porn and i have some issues and (laughs) the demon would show all those to me and i would crumble like you know a house of cards in front of him like that definitely showed me like there is a moral level and father Morris maybe was just a father and not like a bishop, but he was the real deal, you know, of the cloth, like believed in Jesus. And, you know, that made me really, father Morris was kind of creepy at first, but once they talked about him more and he showed what he was doing, like thumbs his nose at the devil, like he's got a little cool oh, yeah. sense of humor. That was yeah. hilarious. Um, you know, like I know I'm on the winning side and I'm going to give you a little what for. So I've talked to our pastor about exorcisms and if like our church was involved in it or something. This was a while ago I asked and he said there that the Southern Baptist Convention actually has a response team that out of Las Vegas. They have a I guess it's a group of I think he said five or seven pastors that are specialized in exorcism and such and that they will respond to doing uh and I, I they're a regional thing, so I think they cover like Arizona uh, Southern California, Nevada, and like you mm. or um, New Mexico or something like that. And I asked him if he would ever do anything like that. And he he was kind of like that same pastor. Like he he would never he would never touch that because mm. I, our pastor is extremely well educated. He wouldn't touch an exorcism. He would call this team out of Las Vegas to come out to do uh, an exorcism mm-hmm. at that level. So because I've always thought it was just a Catholic or, uh, you know, very, very specific churches that were associated, uh, to the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And, but to find out that the Southern Baptist convention was in support of exorcism, I was kind of taken back. I was like, well, okay, that was new to me. I mean, there was, I I like that, you know, some of the history behind, you know, the demons and talked about Satan and, you know, Mm -hmm. the fact that the possessions there was, some some amount of millions of people. It wasn't that many. I mean, it was a few million Italian Catholics, and they do over five hundred thousand exorcisms a year. Yeah. I'm just like, is this a is this a a case of, you know, you say it exists and it exists because people see that as you know they self diagnose, or there are re- like what is going on? Why are there so many? exorcisms going on in Italy mm. and I'd like to know what our stats are here in the US of A like, right. are we corresponding to that or is Italy just you know <laughs> very religious and very demonic all at once Like, yeah, I, I guess know. you could say that's the same thing but right. that was very surprising that you know those statistics that they threw at it and uh, I, I really liked the way it was put together um, you know, I think he did a really good job. You could tell he's a director of some professional skill, and he was a little over dramatic, I think, at times. 
<laughs> in his yeah. intros and outros with his voiceovers and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, did he remind you guys of anybody? An actor? He re- he's he reminded me of John Voight like a lot. His voice mm. is almost exactly like John Voight. The guy. He, so his last one. Um, he was the dad to Nicolas Cage in uh, the National Treasure. Right. Mm-hmm. That's John Voight. Uh, yeah. He's done a thousand different other movies, but he's Angelina Jolie's dad, right? Yeah. 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 Did he remind you guys of? I mean, his voice literally sounds just like John Voight. I think he even kind of looked mm-hmm. like him. Maybe yeah. if he danced. <laughs> John Voight can do some good good dances. <laughs> that's all I that's all I could picture every time I heard his voice or, or saw him on camera. I was like, that's reminded me of John Voight, but all right, well, I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> well, I, yeah. Anyway, I'd give this a recommend, especially if you're religious at all. I think it and it didn't uh degrade my religious point of view or beliefs at all. Um it did. I guess one thing that did concern me, I, I, I want to bring up, was the concept they have of. I guess it's twofold. The the demon can jump or move. You know, you kick it out of her, yeah. and it can move to somebody nearby. Or, yeah. right. Um, you know, like the boyfriend. Like on one hand, I'm like, have you ever seen her act like this? Like, have you ever seen one of these possessions and acted like this boyfriend? And are you still her boyfriend after you see this? Like, yeah. What kind of e-ticket ride is she putting you on? Because I'm not going through <laughs> next to anything to hook up with a demon girl. Like, sorry. Right. And well, and was, she ahead. had multiple after this one that failed. Yeah. Right. They, they said she tried it again with some other yeah. other priests. Like eleven, twelve times, maybe you know, probably not worth it. You know. Right. One or two, she's cured. She's pretty hot. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. But. <laughs> 12, it's, not, it's not you, it's the demon, babe. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe we got to draw the line at some point, right? Right. <laughs> How many of us are in here right now, honey? <laughs> yeah. because <laughs> yeah, I thought that was weird, too, because they were talking about how the demons could jump from one person to the next. And then the very next scene is the exorcism, and there's like 12 people inside that mm-hmm. room that could all oh, yeah. very easily take on the demon if it gets exorcised. Yeah. It's like, I'm not going to be in that room. <laughs> and, and they They're legitimately seemed it. to be care and were praying. They weren't like staring. Like I picture, honestly, as sad as it is an American audience, we're <laughs> doing the Jerry Springer and we're like, oh yeah, demon, demon, like yeah. Facebook and Live more... and <laughs> yeah. and they're and they're they're praying and like you know rubbing their beads and yeah, trying to help. Yeah, there's no way I'd be in that room if I was like believing it. I was like, no, no, I'm not taking on any demons today. Yeah, I'll pray outside. Right. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of shocking to see how many people were in there afterwards. What did you guys think of their little story of when they went to go meet her afterwards oh, up in yeah. that town? And so there was a miscommunication allegedly of where they were supposed to meet and it sounds like the demon was in charge of her and mm-hmm. uh she uh so th- she was they were originally supposed to meet up afterwards in this some some other church yeah in a there village a, yeah village church and so they get there and they get a call from her saying where are you at and she's all pissed off and sounds like she's being like literally like directed by the demons at that point um, no, I didn't say we were going to meet at that, that town. We're meeting at this church. Was I think they said like almost two hours away or something like that. Two hours away. Yeah. So they end up packing up all their equipment and traveling another nearly like two hours away to meet her in this other place. And they have this. So why did did he give an explanation of why he didn't take the camera in? No, he just says I didn't take the camera in for this, which did make me question it. Right. So, and he said the boyfriend was there too. Yeah. So they walk into this church with no equipment or anything, and she's just straight up out of her mind, possessed, just crawling all over the place, nearly crawling up the walls and completely yeah. taken over by the demons and such. And the director says it's like the most scariest moment he's ever had in his life. And uh, the chairs are just sliding across the floor like yeah. while she's in them, like just – yeah. Yeah. Like, she wasn't uh, full snake slithering, but it sounds like she was pretty close to like the snake slither across the floor. Yeah. Yeah. And demanding to have the tapes back and he 
yes. generally it didn't even bring him. It's like, why would I bring him even out of America? Right. Yeah, that was basically... the whole thing. Yeah, and the demons yeah. were threatening to kill him and his family and stuff if they, yeah. if they didn't destroy the films, uh, the cameras and such. That, another thing, going back to the exorcism that I found interesting was during the exorcism, she's obviously struggling a lot, and there's mm -hmm. she's she's showing a lot of physical exertion, but she mm -hmm. is never sweating, and nothing. Mm -hmm. You never see her. You know, she's putting out a lot of energy and force in this chair, and she's being held down by three other full-size grown men. And mm -hmm. one of those grown men, the older guy that was on her right arm. He mm -hmm. is like sweating like a like a yeah. pig, dude. I mean, there's just <laughs> there's multiple parts where you can see him. He's like trying to brush off the sweat off of his nose and off of his forehead, yeah. and he's but red there's faced. yeah, he's just drenched at certain points with sweat. But she's just freaking bone dry, and she'll I... come out of it like that. Like her body will just mm -hmm. be calm. Like there's no like downplaying of the breathing. It's like her body just goes shifts gears. With yeah, no she's recovery and, and and everything, like she doesn't even know what happened. Yeah, yeah. Like she's not gasping for air or trying to catch her breath or anything. The, the guys holding her down are just like, make it stop, yeah. you know? Because they're just exhausted, you know. And she's just like, oh yeah, whatever, you know. Uh, you know, how long has it been that three grown men have been fighting me down, and I'm just fine. Yeah. So that part was definitely weird. I was. Those were the weird little tidbit things. I was like, oh, there's something else going on here. Mm -hmm. Because that's not normal whatsoever. Yeah, and she was fully like every like every muscle in her body trying to stand up and mm -hmm. lift her body parts and like lift her lower body and arching up, you know, bridging up. And, you know, it took all their weight. And at times they were losing the battle and then, you know, they'd barely get back the, the weight or something. Because she's probably no more than a buck fifty, probably a buck thirty in yeah. weight. And these three guys that are well bigger than her are having a hard time. I mean, I honestly, I honestly expected Father Morth to take a right hook or something at some <laughs> point, right? Because he's right up in there, and at times he tells them to let go, and then they have to latch back on, and yeah, yeah. he would just uh, stick out his tongue and. <laughs> thumb his nose. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll go ahead and go on to the last one for this one, and that one's going to be mine. It's on Amazon Prime. It is called Beware the Slender Man. It's originally an HBO original, uh, so you are going to have to pay for this one, like we've mentioned. I think it's like four bucks. Directed by Irene Taylor Brodsky. Uh, prime rating of 91 an IMBD score of 60 I'm sorry IMBD score of 6.2 and a tomato meter of 80% and an audience score of 52 so it does pretty good in its numbers other than the audience score and ultimately what this documentary is about is two 12 year old girls who uh, you find out at the beginning is that uh, they're really into this internet phenomenon or story of this person called the slender man and throughout the documentary they actually do go into some back history before the internet of who uh this um i guess story or um what else would you call that um it started as an thing. art project yeah uh yeah of the slender man well they kind of associate it to other myths you know ancient myths and stuff of who the slender man is but yeah out of your primary thing so anyways uh these this group of three girls uh all 12 years old best friends well two of the girls out of the three are kind of into this slender man internet phenomenon and uh the one girl ends up convincing the other friend that they needed to kill the third friend uh, so that they could uh, appease the Slender Man and that they could go live with the Slender Slender Man on his mansion in some wooded area up in uh, Minnesota area or where. Did you guys write down what that wooded area was? I didn't write it down, but... 
Mm-mm. It was a uh, Nicolette National Park or something. Yeah, like that. Nicolette. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's it. Nicolette National Park, where the Slender Man had a mansion that basically that they could uh, go and live with him for eternity. And so the documentary goes over a lot of uh, interviews with the parents, uh, families, family members. Uh, you see a little bit. Well, you see a lot of of what goes on in the courts because the big debate throughout this documentary is are these girls going to be tried uh, for as an adults or as juveniles and you also find out that uh, it was an attempted murder the uh, the the victim ended up surviving uh, from the attempt from from the two from the from the stabbings that that happened in the documentary um, it definitely has some freaky uh, kind of disturbing artwork and cinematography and graphics throughout this thing uh, mm-hmm. to depict the Slender Man and give you that vibe of of what uh, the youth see as the Slender Man. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of gave you... Have you guys seen the movie Saw? There, there's some images in there that kind of reminded me of Saw. Kinda I've long, never seen Saw. No. I saw the first one, but I didn't, didn't draw out. You didn't draw anything out that, No. Yeah. I mean, I thought the, the intro I really liked until they started telling the roots of the Slender Man, you know, mm. only went back to like 2009. And, mm. But I thought the intro was very Blair Witch-esque, and then they yes. inject inject those uh, still shots of the Slender Man or hit, work him into it. Mm-hmm. I was honestly like, okay, this, is, this might be pretty creepy, creepy. I thought they were going to go along with that. I didn't realize it right. was going to turn into this court TV documentary. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I was hoping. But, yeah. I, I was hoping more of the beginning as compared to the court documentary. It did have a good switch though, or mm-hmm. uh, towards the end. Um, what were your guys' thoughts between what was it, Morgan and Aneta, Anissa? Anissa, like who did you think was the before we before we get to the twist in the, at the end? I guess you could say, who did you guys feel was more at fault? Anissa. For Anissa, yeah. What? How about you? Sean? Was, so when you listen to her parents, you you don't think it's her. You think it's she's Morgan. a dorky girl. But, yeah, but then the the more they show her in interviews and and the more you hear about her, it it was definitely her. She was definitely the yeah. instigator. She was the button pusher. Yeah, yes, sure. Morgan Morgan was the the recept the button holder. Like she was the yeah. button to be pushed. Yeah, yes. for sure. Yes, it was like she she was, uh, like she was jealous of the friendship that Morgan had. Yeah, That's kind of how. And she wanted to get rid of that friendship so that she could have Morgan to herself. Well, Morgan, was it Morgan and Peyton that were friends since kindergarten? Yes. Or Anissa? Yeah. No, yeah. Morgan yeah. and Peyton. And the other, yeah, and it's... they were all just bus stop mates. And dorky Anissa's mom is like, oh, she has a friend that lives nearby. I'm so happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so Anissa but... felt, yeah, like she wanted painting out of the the picture she was like jealous of that so she was pushing the buttons on morgan and anisa is the one that found the anisa. whole creepy posty yeah. website yeah and but at the same time morgan's dad was and mom but mostly dad <laughs> like i get the frustration they had over the whole tablet they have to have a tablet for school that's anisa's parents da- yeah that's anisa's, is that anisa's dad yes yeah that's yeah, he was like, you know, that that they, you know, I was checking on him and, she, you know, every I right. watched stick my head in there and the door was always open and shy of sitting in the room. I knew what she was doing. And yeah, um, but at the same time, he shows his like little bro, little kid. Yeah. just like playing with the cat on the tablet. Like, yeah. You have no control over your kids, like no. what they're doing. You don't you really aren't that engaged as much as you think you are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I didn't. <laughs> Yeah, he definitely it was definitely proven otherwise that he didn't have any control over their kids. Yeah. On those I didn't feel for him in the moment where he was like, you know, the stress of it and his now ex wife right. is behind him agreeing with him. He's just like closed eyed, crying a little bit 
and just the stress of everything is just about to make his head implode and I could yeah. totally feel for him. So what did you, what were your guys' takes on the interviews, the police interviews between Morgan and um, Anissa? Anissa, yeah. So so you know I have zero experience with uh, police interviews. Yeah. But I was uh, I was shocked when they had Morgan. They they read Morgan and rights. There's no parents present. Man. Like like how is it a twelve year old can't can't do that? Can they can't sign that acknowledge that they've been read their rights? Can they? I I thought that was not admissible or you know what i mean oh, like, no, i know it's legit mm-hmm. uh, i was good. yeah i was i was totally shocked that she had no that they had no parents present and that they didn't need it but you know my experience is based on you know yeah. <laughs> tv so yeah. no there was the interviews were legit they they were constitutionally good on the child interviews they still have to give them their miranda warning and such and it's a little bit different for the juveniles because they are like they they're supposed to give you know admon or not admonishment but a statement that you know you can what is it HB basically like yeah if, if you, you want have a parent right, present you yeah, can have so you yeah. have the right to have one yeah yeah so they're told that they can have a, a parent present before being interviewed so or like like an adult one you can have an attorney present so they are given that and so it's totally legit but Morgan yeah. seemed so flat throughout the yeah, entire. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah, she Com- was totally mm-hmm. disconnected from it. Yeah, and that's where I was like, okay, I was concerned about Morgan and thought, okay, there's definitely more to her as compared to the other girl. But the other girl seemed like there was more involvement that she wasn't giving up. Is kind of mm-hmm. how I took her. What was your take, HB? Um, I mean, I was. On one hand, I was really surprised, but I th- and how open the girls were, because um, at that point it sounds like they didn't know. I think they assumed that uh, Peyton was dead based on yeah. how they left her and how quick it kind of went down. And yeah. um, but how upfront they were, you know, like here's a stain on my shirt from you know where she, where I actually got some of her blood on me, and and just so how upfront, you know they were describing each moment of it, like in just chilling stoic detail, you know, okay, you need to write some notes. And then I told her she needed to do it. And, you know, like everything is just very detached. Like that was honestly when I started going, okay, these kids aren't just two little conspiring Mm -hmm. girls. There is some, some issues. And I was, you know, whether it was, I didn't think it was as bad as they, by the end, diagnosed them. Yeah. But uh, I think the fact that the parents, so I've seen different documentaries of kids, and the parents get pissed when it's legitimately not a good interview. And these interviews were, you know, very well done, very professional. Yeah. Really letting them talk and very few questions, not as leading as I've very seen, very much seen at all. And the parents were fine with it. The parents had no issues. Like they had no doubt that their daughters did this. Um, and I wouldn't doubt their daughters told them as much as they asked for in like, you know, jail visits. Yeah. Yeah. If they dared to ask their daughters, which I well, don't it, think they really did. Yeah. It was, it, it was interesting. The one, the one psychiatrist said that, uh, Anissa did not display any, signs of of socio of being a sociopath or a right. psychotic mm-hmm. and yet she was it was chilling listening to her especially yes. when mm-hmm. when like she's talking on the phone with the friend and and dad and everybody and it's just like yeah. oh yeah no big deal you know yeah like yeah yeah out of all of them she should have been the psychopath the yeah one that was mm-hmm. yeah diagnosed as psychopathic but okay, so before we get into the, well, there's literally there's two twists that happen. I was just curious, have you guys ever heard of the Slender Man or seen the costumes or the internet stuff on this? No, so, he reminded me of the the Halloween guy, but I'd right. never heard of him called Slender Man. So yeah. I had seen the comparison on Facebook, the Slender Man versus Jack Skellington, and yes. I had no idea what Slender Man was, so I, I uh. you know, so I just scrolled right past it, but I had seen that on Facebook. Yeah. I've seen the costumes, but that's it. I I had no idea what it, any of it 
it's just like, oh, okay, that's a creepy looking thing, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> tall, slender, faceless man. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, but that was that was the the most of what I ever knew of Slender Man. So this was all new to me as well too. So let's get into the twist. There's two of them. The first one we're given is that uh, Morgan comes back diagnosed with schizophrenia. And uh, with schizophrenia, there's different types of schizophrenia that you can have. And uh, they they go into detail in this documentary pretty well about you can have... Uh, you're seeing things that are obviously not there. You're hearing voices. Uh, mm-hmm. You're basically any... Uh, any of your senses are picking up things that are not there, taste, smell, or you, or you could just be hearing voices, or you could just be seeing things that aren't there. So you, it could be very minuscule. It's kind of like a there, there's a, a pendulum to it, or I guess layers. Continuum. I guess. Yeah, a continuum. Spectrum. Of it. Yeah, a spectrum. Yeah, that's probably the best. A spectrum of schizophrenia and of of how severe you could have it and. Uh, we learned that Morgan started started experiencing these signs and symptoms at the age of three, uh, mm-hmm. of having like imaginary friends, but straight up having conversations with people and creatures that are obviously not there. And they mention very shortly that schizophrenia is very much a hereditary thing, and that it's it's a genetic thing. And throughout the entire documentary, I mean, we're in the very last half of the last, well, like probably quarter of the documentary, and you have never seen or heard of Morgan's dad. <laughs> and that comes, the, that's what brings on the second twist is that you learn, you, you, well, they literally drop you into an interview with a gentleman, and I don't even think they even introduce him as who he is. And he's crying, and he's obviously upset. And then you learn that this is Morgan's dad, and this is the first time you're mm-hmm. seeing him or even hearing about him. And they drop it on you that he is schizophrenic himself. So this is directly, you know, from her dad, Morgan, Morgan's dad, that he's schizophrenic and that he suffered all the same types of things that she had been suffering since she was three years old. And it sounds like his is not nearly as as in depth as hers uh his is more it sounded like visual mm-hmm. uh but his is definitely obviously more manageable uh and then you start to learn about how these parents have had these signs in front of them for <sighs> quite a long time but they never did anything about it or they just I don't just didn't pick up on it uh with all of her drawing mm-hmm. Morgan's drawings or notebooks and her her behaviors since the age of three, and well, the mom the mom says, "Well, dad was so high functioning, right? Like she, it, like it was her way what? of writing it off." Yeah, yeah, like how are you not constantly watching for that? Like I would yeah. always be watching for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, she would have been in counseling like as soon as she was old enough after that three year old incident. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, it was it was uh not surprising in a way once I learned about dad and the mom was very she was borderline simple as I would put it, you know, like just not having any idea of what the world could do or what the internet could do to her daughter and what could be found on the internet. Um it was just I'm like seriously cuz so my wife and I had a discussion about this because there's a mentioning by somebody in there. I think it's one of the doctors, psychiatrists or whatever that um, – and then one of the parents ties in with a comment of basically like, kids don't know it's real until you teach them that it's real or not real. Yeah. And then I, I, I thought – my wife and I talked about it, like how many times since the youngest we can remember you discuss with your kids like TV and nightmares and dreams – And we're huge in our family. Like, we nipped it in the bud from, like, the first we could of there's no such thing as monsters. Monsters are not real. There's no such thing. Like, a nightmare is just a dream, and you can decide to take it over and kick butt, or you can wake up. But it is not real. It is just your brain spinning a story that you can totally take over. Mm -hmm. You know, like, 
I think I think there was an issue with parenting, to say the least, in these kids' lives that they their parents checked out. Like their kids reached an age they could wipe their own ass and feed themselves, and we're done. <laughs> like they they yeah, have an iPad much. to do their homework, and like let's go drink beer and chill, and uh, we're done being a parent because they did not teach their daughters. And I'm amazed there was no like sexual issues. Yeah. About reality. Cause these kids had no concept of internet versus life versus, you know, fake versus real. No. That was frustrating. I thought, yeah. and I think the parents got off easy in the sense that they could take some blame and, you know, not educating their daughter and educating your own kid. You have this issue. I have this issue. Yeah. We need we need to teach you how to manage it sooner than I did, and hopefully beat it better than I did. Yeah, yeah. And I, the mom remind Morgan's mom reminded me of the 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 mothers who know that the boyfriend's like sexually molesting their child, yeah. but they totally ignore it. Right? Yeah, they they sure. write it off, and somehow mm-hmm. they write it off in the back of their head that that's okay or that it's just it's not mm-hmm. really happening. And that's what she reminded me of is is one of those yeah. types of moms where somehow they justify it or write it off in the back of their heads where mm-hmm. it doesn't register in their heads or whatever. I don't know. I, yeah. I did some research, of course, at the end of this <laughs> to figure out what happened to these fine, upstanding individuals. Yes. And uh, I don't know if you guys looked into it, but Anissa, uh, she gets 25 years to life in – confinement involuntarily in a state psychiatric institute oh wow um so that puts her at 37 years old when she could get out after that right yeah wow and then uh morgan the stabber gets 40 years to life with at least three years in locked confinement in a state psychiatric institute um until the age of 53 is when they say she can get out Wow. So these these girls now young women are basically hosed. Like right. they, if they do get out, they're not going to amount to much in society. Right. Their their they're, lives basically ended at twelve years old. Yeah. Just yeah. This one event, or series of events leading to this event, they're done. Like at yeah. best, they're going to end up like our last documentary chick, and you know, being yeah. a hooker serial killer. Right. All because of Apple iPads. Yes. <laughs> and the Wakash, whatever school district making them have them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Apple iPads are to blame for it all. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it was funny watching this. I had, I have never been a fan of trying kids as adults. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and then the the one thing the judge said that actually really struck home with me was. If we don't try them as adults, when they turn 18, we have no tabs on them. There's no way to keep tabs on them. Yeah, it's all and, clean slate. And and that made me really think. Okay, that now that makes that makes total sense to me. Right. Because these girls can't be out there without any tabs on them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we need to be able to keep track of them. I don't know if I'd have given them 25 years to life because they clearly don't have a complete sense of reality in their minds. But mm-hmm. but I I. I get trying them as adults for sure. Yeah. So HB, was there any mention of Elisa being diagnosed with anything if she got sentenced to a, a mental facility? She had to have been diagnosed with something after the fact then. Well, they did. They did talk about it. I thought during the trial how they were both. They were they were both diagnosed with different things. Oh, um, did they? I, somehow I missed that. Then well, she obviously Morgan obviously had the. Schizophrenia. Oh no, yeah, you're right. They did talk about her diagnosis. I just can't remember yeah. what it was. Yeah, I'm trying, well, they both they pleaded innocent by reasons of insanity. Yeah, they found not guilty by reasons of mental disease or defect. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the exact phrasing of what it was. But yeah, they both were diagnosed with some with mental illness, schizophrenia. I think was one of them. Yeah. Because the delusions were so big. Yeah. Um, and the, the false belief in this, you know, slender man that it's like, you truly believe this. And yeah, mm-hmm. I believe this. And, you know, I saw him when I was three and 
Yeah, I can't find the exact wording on what they diagnosed him with. Yeah, I don't but remember either. It was pretty crazy, you know. And then the you know the poor girl that you know, wow, you thought your best friends loved you, and amazingly, she goes back to she gets stabbed in May of 2014, May 30th, almost June. Yeah. She's back to school in September of the same year. Yeah. And she only spends seven days in the hospital. Like that's one thing that got to me is like, yes. She was stabbed 19 times. I mean, it's a miracle that she lived. She would have died if she didn't have that willpower to drag herself to the roadside to get found. Right. Um, and so then she dies, and yes, it's a full-blown murder, and then it wouldn't even been more extreme. But Right. Um, she only spent seven days in the hospital, and this these girls were in jail, I think, for two years before the full trial. Yeah. Was, you know, they're in, they're in jail for a year before they get deemed adults. Right. Yeah. I'm just like, that is a crazy amount of time. On one hand, I don't have a problem with it because I don't want them out running around having a good old time and, you know, as the crazy girls mm-hmm. in school. But at the same time, I'm like, a year in jail? Right. Like, at one point, is it like time served? I mean, <laughs> right. Because she didn't die. Like, it's not a murder. It's a right. BDW, it's an attempted, basically. Yeah. An attempted yeah. murder is what they, you know, obviously got it to because they intended to kill her. Right. The by intent. their own admission. Yeah. Right. But that's a ton of time for a 12-year-old. Like, they're they're going through, and it's like, oh, it's been a month. Oh, it's been two months. Oh, it's been six months since yeah. we saw our daughter. Or since she's been out. You know, we see her once a week, and I'm just like, that would be mind-blowingly mm-hmm. difficult to deal with as a parent. Oh, yeah. And, that's definitely a crazy story from yeah. every angle you look at it. Yeah. From parents to the Internet to what these girls did and what they believed in and mm-hmm. there's no normalcy whatsoever in this <laughs> yeah. story. So. Mm-hmm. All it tells you is know who your kids' friends are, know what your kids are doing on the internet. Right. You mm-hmm. know, be involved in their lives, not just, not just a little yeah. bit, be involved. Be nosy. Yeah. yeah. So did you guys have the same feeling as me of wanting to take out all the iPads and <laughs> tablets and <laughs> <laughs> burn them well, in the trash. Yeah. Well, we only have one my yeah. six year old has and he gets he gets a half hour on Saturdays and Sundays each. Yeah. And that's it. So ours are locked yeah, down. Yeah, definitely. And, and yeah, they're they, kept in our room. Yeah, and they can only use them in the living room right in front of us. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're a little bit more liberal than you guys, but freaking after watching this, I was like, hmm. Just trash them all. <laughs> I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, uh, it's a poor excuse on my part, but it's like it's the one time that I can like get stuff done is when I know that they're all kind of like separated and just like plugged in, I guess yeah. as you could say it. You know, otherwise they're just freaking yeah. at each other's throats and <laughs> just <laughs> gives yeah, us a tough. little break. But I get it. I totally get it. All right. Well, I think that's going to go ahead and do it for this episode. Thanks for listening. We greatly appreciate it. Talks on Docs is a community podcast, meaning we want to get to know you and to talk to you, the listeners. But to make that happen, we need you to first contact us. Please feel free to email us at talksondocs at gmail.com. Or if you prefer, contact us on Facebook at Talks on Docs or on Twitter at Talks on Docs. Beautiful day for a neighbor, would you be mine?